Great. I'm just making sure somebody can hear me. So, so I want to welcome everybody to to this webinar today. Um, we're very pleased to have uh, with us today um, no one from uh, Chile, who many of you may know. Um, uh, uh, many years that he's uh, worked with uh, with uh, and around the QIO community, uh, helping on a range of issues, you know, around uh, contracting and accounting and other things, and so. Um, uh, we're very thankful for Noah to uh, make himself available to provide some really valuable input uh, to the community uh, through this webinar today on subcontract management. Um, I look to uh, do some more of these types of things going into the future, and we'll talk about that at the end of the, the call. Um, so I'm not going to delay any further. I'll just point out that during this presentation today, uh, all uh, the participants will be in a listen-only mode uh, in the question and answer session at the end of the presentation questions submitted via the Q&A feature. Uh, we're recording this webinar, and it's going to be posted afterwards, uh, and we'll uh, give you some information about that. Uh, so thanks to, uh, to to Noah and to his colleague Ann and, and others that have helped with putting this together. And Noah, I'll turn it to you. I'd, uh, I'd like to take a couple short minutes to introduce myself again. Uh, my name is Noah Leiden. I'm a partner with Baker Tilly uh, in our government contractor advisory services practice. Um, and thank, I would like to thank Aqua for giving me the opportunity to, to do this presentation. Uh, Todd stated, uh, I've been working with the QOs uh, since the fourth scope RFP and worked with uh, several of the, the, the QIOs, as Todd said, whether it's in the proposal development, accounting, incurred cost emission, and or responding to the DCA audits that you guys go, go through. Uh, background is I started my career in DCAA for three years and then moved over and uh, joined um, a, a big six firm and started in their government contractor uh, advisory services. And more through uh, the through the years, uh, I've continued to uh, gain uh, the QIO program, and hopefully, some of the insight that I'll give you today uh, will be able to help you in managing subcontracts. So we're going to talk today about our. We're going to go provide a quick introduction. Uh, as to the importance of subcontract management and why it happens. Um, we'll discuss the issues in identifying and awarding and managing the subcontracts. Uh, we'll get to more or less uh, conceptions as to what subcontract management is. We'll talk some of the focus on subcontracting. Your fund subcontracting is going to be very similar to how the government views contracting with a prime. Uh, so we'll through some of those examples. Uh, we'll talk about the how the clauses section of the RFP or the contract uh, influ are influenced by either regulatory clauses, your operations, or how you're going to re report uh, your financial um, responsibilities back to the government. Go so into looking at the subcontract life cycle phases. Uh, sometimes it's easy to um, break up the subcontract into different phases through a life cycle. So we'll go through different phases uh, and what those mean to you. We'll talk about briefly about some considerations and how you can use templates to make your life easier in managing contractors. <laughs> and we'll also uh, talk about some key takeaways. Uh, why do people issue contracts? I mean, people issue subcontracts because today government contracts are complex in, in, in what they're expecting or what they're asking for. Um, organizations look at the, at the RFP or the contract and say, we don't have the ability to do that. And as a result, we need to go out and get those resources. In addition to not having the resources, or the, the capability or the capacity to do that, uh, the government has the socioeconomic programs established within the FAR that say, hey, we're going to give you this contract, but at the same time, we're going to expect you to uh, apportion this out to small disadvantaged businesses. Uh, 
when it's done, the government is relying on you to act in their place, um, you know, on, on behalf of the government. And what, what you're what you're more or less looking at is you're saying the government expects this of me. Should I act that of my subcontractor? So look at yourself in the mirror. You should, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but you should see the government contracting officer on the other side or the reflection of that person. Um, and set, again, for a contract to be successful, you have to make sure that you're managing your subcontractor in a proper way. Um, it's with a subcontractor. They're not only subcontractor issues, they become prime contractor issues. Uh, for example, we had a client one time, a long time ago, for a large contract. And they had met with the government, they had met with the contracting officer to go over their monthly status reports. And one of the questions that the contracting officer asked the, the prime was, how are you guys doing in terms of funding and, and in terms of cost? Contract had the limitation of cost and limitation of funds clauses in it. Connor around said, We're good, we're running about 50, 55 percent. There's no need to worry about it right now. About after they had that meeting, the subcontractor came in with a $5 million invoice that I didn't know about. And all of a sudden, they moved from 50, 55 percent past the 75 percent. They had to go back to the the contracting officer at that point in time and say, we have an issue. Well, is that a subcontracting issue? That now becomes a, an issue with the contracting officer. It impacts your responsibility to effectively manage your subcontractor. So, um, again, you're looking at yourself as the government. What would the government do? And also, um, when you have contract management, it goes over three environment that influence it, the regulatory, the FAR, the CAS, OMB, A133, the super circular, operational. Who's and what? Is, it internal, is the business managing the subcontract? Is the program managing the subcontract? And that impact the cost that you're going to ultimately bill to the government. And as we all know, sometimes we go into a contract or into a permanent award thinking we can do everything. There's always modifications. So at that point in time, the modification may come out and say, you need to do something that, that you don't have the capability to do. So contract requirements can be defined any time prior to award or after the award of a contract. that happens is I think there's a misconception about what subcontract management really is. A lot of, if, if, if you ask a lot of government contracts and say, hey, what's subcontract management? They're going to turn around and say, well, it's the administration of the subcontractor. Well, what's the administration? People that and will say, well, that's the identification, the award, the close out, and that's all it entails. Subcontract management is the program people. They're managing the, the, the contractors on a day-to-day -day basis. And they're making sure that whatever deliveries or whatever the statement of work says, the subcontractor is performing accurately. So there's a misconception there of what it is. And what the graph on the, or what the illustration on the slide represents is saying, yeah, we understand that administration is one side of the house business, the procurement department, to do their due diligence, to do to do the responsibilities to identify and make the awards. But at the same time, you have people that need to understand and, uh, or make sure that the subcontractor is doing what they are supposed to do. And not separate. They have to have some relationship to each other. Uh, they talk back and forth to each other. The the management side of the house needs to understand what is in the procurement, what is in the subcontract award. And the procurement will need to know what are the issues that are coming out as performance goes on, are, are having issues with the subcontractor. And 
it's one size fits all. I mean, this is an issue with some of the largest government contractors out there. And the QIO environment is a little bit different. In the QIO environment, you may have the finance department acting as a procurement function. That person playing jack of all trades. A, B, a limited number of program management people, or there was one person that's responsible for a certain task within the Quinn contract. So you have to look at this slide and say, how can we take this and adjust it so that individuals know their responsibilities uh, when it comes to managing the subcontractor? So I said about subcontract management, to understand it, you to probably break down into a life cycle. And that life cycle consists of of uh, doing some pre-award planning. It's about breaking the, the life cycle or, or the part of the management down into the award of the subcontract. And then you have the post-award uh, section. The subcontract closed out, and then there's a project cost and analysis and reporting function to it. And into this a little bit later, but when I talk about the life cycle, these are the five separate phases or segments of that life cycle or of a subcontract that you'll see are commonly broken out uh, to make managing the subcontract a little bit easier. And at each phase, there's going to be specific tasks or requirements that individuals with an organization are going to have to take responsibility for. So when going back to the prior slide for the subcontract administration, they're going to take a lot of the lead in pre-award planning. They're going to do maybe the the, the unification of, of terms and conditions, or they're going to put together the RFP package. But at the same time, they're going to rely on program people. The program people need to tell them, we don't have resources or the capacity to do this type of work. So it, it, understanding the roles and responsibilities through each of these phases helps manage the subcontractor. What's in the contract is critical. I mean, you don't look at a subcontractor and say, okay, guys, here, uh, here's the statement of work. Go do it for us or give a price for it. It's more than that. A lot of times what will happen is, is if you understand what's in the contract, you're going to run into problems. You understand that it's, it's just what's in the statement of work or, or within Section C of the contract or the RFP, additional items with sections G, H, or I that need to be addressed. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. As I stated before, many of the activities that you are performing are inherent to the government. So when the government is managed in the prime, you're the government and you're now managing the subcontractor. Talk about focusing on subcontracting. What you got is, is 242 or FAR Part 44.2. What is this? Basically, these are the requirements that the government utilizes out of the FAR to subcontract. And, and when the team is going to subcontract that, that out work, the government will look at this and say, what are we going to expect to see from the prime to ensure that we're acting in the best interest of the government when awarding the contract? Under the phrase a CPSR. A CPSR is a Contractor Purchasing System Review. It's typically awarded when, um, or a CPSR is typically perform when a, a contractor has over $25 million in cost reimbursable con contracts. It basically goes in, and it's a, it's a review by the government it states, the, contracting, the contractor understands their responsibilities. They do their due diligence and they look at specific items to, to make sure the awards are being proper. And just highlighted some of those key criteria 
on this slide. For example, socioeconomic clauses. Okay, well, are, are the is the problem meeting those requirements that are in there? So the small disadvantaged business plans. Do they have outreach programs to make sure that they're enticing or they're pulling in small disadvantaged businesses to the extent possible into our federal contractors? at the responsibility and the qualifications of the subcontractors. And what this means is, response, do they have the financial capability? Do they have the resources from a subcontracting, from a subcontractor's point of view to support the plan? At the same time, it's looking at the, the risk associated with that and saying, what type of subcontract award is the prime going to make? Is it going to be a cost reimbursable contract, a price reimbursable contract? Or an M type contract or subcontract, because each of those have different responsibilities. If you're not a subcontractor and you're going to give them a cost reimbursable contract, the prom have better gone out and done their due diligence to make sure that there's an adequate accounting system with that subcontractor to accumulate and report those costs to prime, and for the prime then to turn around, turn that around. If not. Well, they're going to probably fall back onto a fixed price or a T&M type contract. Um, the project has some requirements to found certain FAR clauses, not only to protect the, the prime, but the mandatory clauses to protect the government's interests. Understanding that, that to get consent, it's just not for the prime, it may not just be for the contract itself. It may be for any individual task order or any individual modification that is out from the government. So the government is looking at it and they're expecting the prime to do that same type of, that same level of review of the subcontractor. Earlier, the focus of the subcontract is of subcontract management is more than just a statement of work. Look at the, the at the, the the contract or RFP. Your the statement of work in section C and some uh, items in section J. But it's important to understand that there are additional areas of the contract that the, that the subcontractor needs to understand. So when the when you look at the prime contracts FAR clauses, especially in, in in section I, there's a lot of items in there that are going to influence how you manage your subcontractors. So you have to understand those additional FAR clauses that are in section I as well as maybe G and H, and understand okay, if I contract, what do I have to make sure that my subcontractor understands from those sections? Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a second. But look at the, the, the Quinn contract. It's an, IDI, an IDIQ award. So the, the terms and the conditions from Section I are to be captured within the IDIQ award. As task, award, as task orders come out, the task may have separate types of clauses in each individual task order. So it's important to understand that, that as task orders come out or as you start to make, make subcontract awards off those task orders, are there unique clauses in there that, that are different from the IIQ that need to flow down? So, uh, an example could be a task order is, is a cost reimbursable type. Well, is specific requirements within and FAR clauses that you might have to flow down to the sub. So the influence of, of this on, on to the onto the sub, I back in, and looked at the Quinn RFP, and this may be different than the actual contract award, but look at the RFP and G, H, and I, there are a handful of 
section there that has unique requirements. If you look at section G4, payments vouchers, there's certain things in there that say, this is how we expect you to prepare your payments and, and, and your invoices. Well, we're expected to do that. Contractors be expected to do the exact same thing. G has audit of hours. Okay, well, if the government can come in and audit your hours, shouldn't you have the right then to the ability to audit the hours of your subcontractors? But within each of these individual sections, there's specific requirements. What's interesting is when you look at G4 all the way down through H15, what's unique about those are they're all clauses that are in section I that relate to each one of those sections. That's not the contract saying, hey, audit hours, we have the right to to come in and audit your hours. Well, okay, fine, put that in a section. It has the teeth of it actual in an actual FAR clause. So understand that passing down this because we really just want to pass this down to a subcontractor. We're passing this down to a subcontractor or this particular clause down to a subcontractor because we're required to. And then the balance of these are, for example, H15, sorry, G7 down through H3, uh, governance requirements, A3 audits, uh, the food, things like that. Those are all contracts, specific, I'll be contract specific requirements. Now, and start playing the subcontract award, this is what we're talking about. You just don't focus on the statement of work. You have to look at all the different sections of the contract to see what's unique in this contract that I need to pass down to my sub to, to, to not only protect myself, but at, to act in the interest of uh, the federal government. Um, I do trainings with another individual, and he'll use the phrase RPC, and people will look at him and say, well, what's RPC mean? And read the contract. At me, and it goes, but if you're working with Noah, Noah will turn around and say, RTFC. A little giggle out of it, and he'll go, no, read the federal contract. So just a little bit of amusement there for you. The point is, read the contract, understand what's in those sections so that you can make sure your subcontractor or make sure that those are included in the subcontract and that your contract or your subcontract understands that and those requirements. We talk a lot about the different contract clauses within Section I. If those closely and you, and you look at maybe some federal contracting books, they'll talk about mandatory flow down clauses and optional flow down clauses. The flow down clauses are those clauses that the government will say, you will put these in your contract. And there is no ifs, ands, or buts about them. There's no negotiation about them. It says, and a lot of those are centered around socioeconomic issues. So, for example, small disadvantaged businesses, uh, the small business plans, all the um, uh, labor requirements or labor laws that are out there. Those are all socioeconomic that are being flowed down to the subs. So, if at the bottom of the page, we have, I laid out a couple that I identified in the RFP. So. Contractor Code of Business Ethics and Conducts. That's a notorious flow down. So if you are awarding a subcontract that's in $5 million, and I think it's over 90 days or 120 days, it is required to follow that clause within the uh, bar. Same thing with audit and records. And I've done here also is I've cross referenced this back to the section that I pulled it from, from the RP. So if you go back to the, I mean, it, it, 
remember from the, the prior slide, if you go back to there, I have the exact same sections of RFP that I that I pulled out. There's a direct correspondence from a section to a mandatory clause. So go to the audit and records. The records was in was in your invoice section. Um, so the government has the right to come in and do the audit of the hours. Same thing with the utilization of small business concerns. So understanding why those clauses have to be in the in the contract helps you in managing the subcontract. When the subcontractor comes back and says, I'm letting the government come in and do any audits, well, guess what? You open that up. It's a mandatory flow down clause. The key item there is the government of the or the uh, the emission of government property. Quinn's got a f of government furnished property. Well, specific requirements that you are going to have to have your subcontractors perform when any uh, computers or laptops or servers uh, and a mandatory flow down clause that there there there's negotiations about. Optional flow down clauses. Is that the government says it's up to you what you want to do. The prime, you're going to look at some of the clauses and say, yep, I'm going to make sure that I put these into the contractor and I'm going to make sure that the subcontractor understands what they mean. Uh, what you certify when you when negotiated your contract. Costs that you proposed were current, accurate, and complete, and and, and a point of the award. Well, you're going to do the exact same thing with your prime, or I'm sorry, with your subcontractor. The government comes back to you and says, "Well, later on, we figured out that your subcontractor did X, Y, and Z, and that the costs weren't current, accurate, or complete." They're going to coming to you. They're not coming back. To the subcontractor because there's no privity of, 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 of contract with them. So it's in the prime's best interest to make sure that they flow down that clause to the sub. So if the government comes after the prime, the prime can then turn around and go after the subcontractor. The cost and payment clause that would be something that, that would be a mandatory flow down clause. Uh, actually, it, it, it's optional. And the importance of that is, is you're subject to the prime is subject to uh, the allowable cost and payment clause, which requires an in cost emission, which are, which also uh, only entitles the prime to reimbursement of actual allowable costs. Flow down to a sub, and the, the sub can basically bill you whatever they want to. They don't have to worry about allowable costs. Or after you turn around and bill that to the government, the government comes back and says, well, we're not going to pay for that because that's an unallowable cost. And it just happens to be the subcontractor's cost. You have any right to go back to the, to the, to the sub and say, oh, I'll pay you for, for that because it's unallowable per the FAR. The pro if I'm the subcontractor, I'm going to turn around to the subcontractor and say, that isn't in my that isn't in my subcontracts, and there's nothing about allowability of costs. So it's going to cause an issue between uh, the prime and the sub. So there's some examples of uh, of optional clauses that you can flow down. into a little bit more of the subcontract management and the actual phases <clears throat> associated with the life cycle. To think that processes can be standardized uh, helps the prime uh, manage the subcontractor. And when I talk about standardizing things, it's not only the systems, but it's the deliverable. It's the analysis. It's thing that you can replicate not only on one subcontractor, but on your subcontractors. 
clear, knowing the activities and the responsibilities within the organization is critical. Understanding who's taking responsibility or the lead in a particular phase or what the responsibilities of an individual are within a phase. Uh, not only to manage a subcontract, the subcontractor, it's good for the organization because you know that, that as a program person, if I'm having an issue, I go to the business side of the house. I don't have to handle it. Uh, we go to council or we go to procurement. And again, not it's one size fits all organization. So you may have one person within the business side of the house being a jack of all trades deal with the procurement side of the house. But understanding those rules and responsibilities helps. So look at what what goes on in different phases of life cycle. In the pre-award, you gain a, a, an RFP, or the prime has taken the RFP, and they're reviewing it. And they're reviewing it for different things. They're looking at it and saying, OK, okay the capability or the capacity to meet the requirements of the RFP. If not, we're going to subcontract out of it and define within there exactly what are the technical and the performance requirements that we need to flow down. This is, again, this is just looking at a statement of work and saying, yep, yep, take the cut and paste it, the statement of work and send it to a prime, or I'm sorry, send it to a subcontractor. It's more, like I said, it's being in and looking at, at what are those clauses that we need to, to discuss, what are those risks and the subcontract types that we need to talk about. Um, we anticipated lo dollar levels that we're looking at from, from the subcontractor's point of view. Uh, we have, for example, when you put together a, a, a proposal, a number in mind. Well, subcontractor award going to impact that number. And once you start negotiating with the with with government, how does that subcontractor number change? You're going to go through and look at the terms and conditions and identify whether those still make sense. Which do we need to flow down? Um, can we eliminate? Are there things that we do, that that need to be focused on? Um, are types of contractors? Are these going to be sole source awards? All this play a role in how you manage the pre-award phase. The award phase, I mean, actually going through now and you're evaluating the subcontractor submission. You're looking at it and saying, okay, make the, they, they can do all the technical requirements, but at the same time, are they accepting all the the terms and conditions? Are they, have they done the, the reps and certs? Are there any problems with that? To the prime to look and say, hey, are we meeting? Our small disadvantaged business requirements. Uh, looking at all these types of different things, um, phase, typically the business takes the lead because they're doing the negotiations with, with the support of the program people. But what's important during this phase is that the subcontractor understands their responsibility. So the subcontractor and say, hey, do you understand? These are clauses. Do you understand you are signed for? That helps in the remaining phases because it eliminates uh, any subsequent discussion. And you typically do this during an award meeting, or maybe even prior to the award. Uh, so, making, so making sure that the, the, the sub understands the responsibilities is critical during this phase. Done the award, you're often thinking life is going to get pretty easy now. But unfortunately, during the post award phase, a lot of things start fall, the, the wheels start falling off sometimes. Um, because this is when now you're starting to get the invoices. You have to have the issues 
with uh, some of the post-award activities. For example, indirect rate. Well, subcon depending on what type of contract are you awarded, if you award a cost reimbursable subcontract, they're going to have to continually update their indirect rates throughout the, the throughout the contract. Uh, there's typical times, for example, when the indirect rates change. At the end of the year, at the end of the year, and once maybe the final rates are identified. So to make sure during the post-award phase that your subcontractors are updating their billings accordingly. At uh, this time, you're also looking and saying, are contractors actually performing the way they're supposed to be performing? Like providing us the deliverables that they're supposed to be delivering to, to us. Are they deliver those, deliver, uh, those deliverables or those sets reports in the format that we are required to. CMS has a lot of difficult or a lot of tedious uh, requirements in, in print an invoice. Well, if you into the subcontract that your subcontractor has to submit in the same format, are you getting the data that you're going to turn around an invoice or put to a status report in the same format that that they've agreed upon? If not, you're going to have issues because there's no reason for the prime work of the sub if it's a contract requirement. Uh, another that comes up a lot of times is during the post award is the is cost mission. Will not, or I'm sorry, subcontractors will not allow primes to look at the rates. Even in an invoice, the rates are probably fully burdened. The, the rates in the ICS that it creates are, are going to be proprietary, and the sub doesn't want the, 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 the prime to see that. So how are you going to identify uh, or, or review the sub's rates if they're not going to give you access to it? Obviously, you're going to rely on DCAA, but if DCAA isn't the constant auditor, who do that? So somehow during that, Board phase or that planning phase, you identify how you're going to work these things out with the subcontractor. So apply with A133 audits where, okay, it's a no-brainer if the sub is a not-for-profit, they have a requirement to do an A133. But if a commercial company, well, the commercial company isn't required to do A133, but they could do program or an A133 like audit. But again, what access are they going to give to the prime thing that you want to work out during the award phase? Closeout, I mean we're gonna have similar issues with closeout. Uh, you're gonna want to make sure that all the government property is being uh, treated accordingly. You're gonna want to make sure that all the releases that uh, usually prepared during a contract closeout are obtained from your contractor. And how is the subcontractor, whether depending on the, the type of contract, how is the, for example, an ICS pretending to hold up the closeout of the prime? Are there agreements to do either quick closeouts or independent reviews of the final incurred cost emissions? Uh, to ensure that, that those costs that the the, the sub may have billed you over the last three five years are allowable, so that years or four years down the road, and you get audited by a, there are no issues. And how are you going to resolve those issues? There's a lot of consideration to work around during the the, the closeout process. Process and reporting. The mornings here, going back to my initial example of the <clears throat> of the prime who wasn't tracking their subcontractor costs. The key. If it's if anything, get it required or put it in the subcontract. 
there is some type of a limitation of cost or limitation of funds clause that requires the, the subcontractor to notify you where funding or their costs stand. Sometimes you may not get timely invoices from your subcontractors. Contractors may bill you whenever they feel the need to. Well, that's not going to help you when you get that large invoice and all of a sudden that you see, oh, not only are we close to max, maxing out our subcontractor funding, pretty close, or we've exceeded the prime responsibility to report the limitation of cost or limitation of funds uh, requirements in the prime contract. So some of this stuff easier. To the extent that you can incorporate templates throughout uh, the, the, the subcontract award, what be in the statement work helps to have maybe an internal template uh, within, within the program to be able to say, hey, if our program people want to do a statement of work, here are the five things that I need. Just not a cut and paste job. It makes them think about it. Um, system reports or status reports or even invoices. As a subcontractor, you put a subcontract that you will prepare your status reports or assist or any reports or any invoices in the format that, that time is required to do, providing the, the level of detail that you need. Uh, and Going back to the subcontractor, asking them for, well, you didn't give me A, A, B, and C. I need A, B, and C to prepare my invoice. Sound cash flow to the prime. So to the extent that you can use templates to get standardized documents or submissions from your from sub, do it. So in the last 45, we, we just spent the last 45 minutes is quick going uh, through all these slides quickly, but the key takeaways is, is fr from this presentation is, is understanding that, that many subcontracts is a combination of the business side of the house and the program side of the house. It's not the responsibility of one or the other. And to the extent you, you can create and identify those activities, it will make subcontract management a lot easier. Um, subcontract management isn't a one-size-fits-all. You're going to have to look at the type of subcontractors that you have. Are they commercial contracts? Are, are they not-for-profits? Um, are they subject to A133? What types of audits are they subject to? Um, you have to sort of design all that and think about and consider all that during the, the, the planning and the award phases of, of the of the subcontract life cycle. To the extent that you can do that, hopefully you're going to eliminate or minimize issues with your subcontractors going forward. Uh, that that is all that I have for today, and we're going to look at some of the Q and A's to see what types of questions that we have. So everybody's lines are unmuted, so if you have a question that you would like to ask, uh, feel free. Okay, it doesn't sound like we have anybody, so I'll go through the questions that were submitted online. All right, one of the questions is, given the time intensity slash cost of monitoring and enforcing compliance of the various requirements of subcontract performance and determining the allowability of cost, is it generally better and more efficient to subcontract on a fixed price basis? I answer that question basically saying it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on the statement of work. If you have a statement of work that can be really identified and can be estimated rather easily, 
for like a commodity or something like that, and that you can fix price it. Fix price it because I would imagine the subcontractor would appreciate the fixed price arrangement as well because it helps them maximize their margins. Uh, problem with that is, is if there are a lot of changes to the statement of work, a half lot of modification to that fixed price arrangement because the sub's going to turn around and say, well, that wasn't in my statement of work and this is a new change to it. So there's going to be a lot of change requests. In what cases can contract-specific compliance cost? Be charged to the contract as a direct cost versus the cost of administering a company-wide compliance function. It only benefits a single contract. This is that's a challenging question. Uh, it all depends on the accounting practices of the organization. Uh, most of the of the contracts are subject to CAS, whether it be full CAS coverage or um, modified cast coverage. And one of the cost accounting standards, 402, requires that there be consistency in the way that you treat like costs. So, for example, if you've always had a compliance function within an organization, and, act, and, and what's required of the contract is very similar to that, would probably follow your normal accounting practices. However, if, the con if that compliance function requires something specific to the contract, and if you can separately identify the cost associated with that, and it's a common act or it's not similar to any other activities that you're performing, uh, or it could be a direct cost. But I know CMS is very particular about these the, those types of circumstances, and I mean CMS wants to see the types of costs charged indirectly. And a copy of this presentation, yes, we can. It's posted online, so you should be able to obtain that. Questions, because that's all the questions that were submitted. If they appreciate, I appreciate everyone's time. Uh, hopefully, uh, you got something, one or two things from this presentation. And, and once you look at the slides a little bit more uh, deeply and and spend some time looking at it and thinking about it. Hopefully some of the, the, the comments or even some of the suggestions in the deck will help you enjoy your subcontractors. And with that, I thank one again. Thank you so much, Noah. Uh, um, this is Todd. Uh, so, um, as we wrap up here, I'm going to turn to my my copy bird, like to maybe go through a couple of things that we want to cover before, um, before we close. You want? Thank you, Todd. Um, yes, thank you, Noah, for a great presentation. Um, just a couple of things before we conclude today's webinar. Uh, a recording of today's webinar will be posted on our YouTube page in the next couple of days. So be sure to check our website for that link. And we will send a post-webinar survey shortly, and we encourage all of you to complete this survey. In this way, we ask you to select some topics you'd like us to focus on for future webinars. And we're also pleased to announce that we will continue to host webinars with Noah and his colleagues over the next several months. These are 
will take place on the third Thursday of every month at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. The first one is scheduled for Thursday, April 16th, and we'll send out a full schedule with the topics based on the survey responses in the next few days, so please complete the survey. And lastly, the next webinar is this Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time called AIT for Post-Acute Care, Learnings from Stratus Health that will offer insights from the one-year special project Stratus Health undertook during the QIO 10th scope of work. Um, we'll send out the registration link for that again shortly. Again, I thank Noah for sharing your considerable knowledge. Todd, do you have anything else? Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you, everybody.